Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about Claude McKay and his role in the Harlem Renaissance. I'm going to briefly discuss some of his biography and his role in the Harlem Renaissance. And then I'm going to look a little bit more closely at two of his more famous poems, America and the Harlem Dancer. So first, Claude McKay was born in 1889 in Jamaica. To say that he became a, a major character in the Harlem Renaissance is actually a little bit debatable. He had a bit of a, of a, well, not a hostile relationship, but some have described it as hostile relationship with some of the other major thinkers of the Harlem Renaissance. He wasn't a proponent of the racial uplift ideology that others like Langston Hughes uh, were in favor of. And this in particular said that it was the duty of middle class and educated blacks to uh, uplift the others uh, in their community, everyone else in their community. Um, he was not, uh, as I said, a supporter of that idea, although he was very much in support of his community. And in, in fact, globally, he didn't even spend that much time in the U S uh, before he went to the UK and then over to Russia and a number of other places where he was involved in civil rights issues for people of Africa. Um, so he was definitely involved in his culture, although there was there were ideological differences between he and Langston Hughes. Also, there were some very striking differences between his writing style and the newer style that more of the Harlem Renaissance poets embraced. Um, in fact, it's kind of ironic. Uh, he, he might not even be con he might not have been considered a member of the Harlem Renaissance by others at the time and might not have even considered himself one uh, in some ways. But uh, we consider him definitely one of the, the early Har Harlem, Harlem Renaissance writers now. Again, one of the things that marks him as notably different from the others is that he uses traditional forms. He has said that he was most at home writing in the form of the English sonnet. Uh, in fact, his he, he writes of that, uh, I have adhered to such of the older traditions as I find adequate for most of my lawless and revolutionary passions and modes. I have not used past patterns, images, and words that would stamp me a classicist nor a modernist. I have never studied poetics, but the forms I have used, I am convinced, are the ones I can work in with the highest degree of spontaneity and freedom. So that's an interesting way of putting that. That's, uh, by the way, that is quoted from Wolfgang Kerr in her article, Black Modernism, the Early Poetry of Jean Toomer and Claude McKay. Now, that is an interesting way of describing things because all of that free expression and spontaneity sounds a lot more romantic. And he has been described as a romantic poet by a lot of others. So that puts him a little out of time, right? Uh, but as they write in the Norton Anthology of American Literature, uh, it's not just about form. You know, certainly he's using more traditional forms, um, but into the polite forms of older poetry, he smuggled in glaring topics, the trauma of slavery, prostitution, and lynchings in language that refused to look away from reality. So in this way, he, he's going a little bit be, beyond where Dunbar has gone in some of his traditional uses, of, of, use of traditional poetry um, by showing a darker, grittier side to things. This also is part of why he bumped heads uh, against with some of the other um, thinkers and major thinkers and major artists of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, a lot of people didn't appreciate the way he would show uh, Harlem in its raw state, in its not, he would celebrate the beauty of black culture, but he would also show the degradation. And this was what many of the other writers at the time objected to. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at one of his poems right now. All right, let's take a quick look at this poem by Claude McKay titled America. First, I'm going to go through and uh, let, let's identify some obvious things about it. It's a sonnet. It has 14 lines uh, and its rhyme scheme matches that of a Shakespearean sonnet. So let me, let's go through it real quick. Although she feeds me bread of bitterness, that's an A, she, uh, and sinks into my throat her tiger's tooth, B, 
be different rhyme. Stealing my breath of life, I will confess. I love this cultured hell that tests my youth. Her vigor flows like tides into my blood, giving me strength erect against her hate. Her bigness sweeps my being like a flood. Yet as a rebel fronts a king in state. Yet, that's interesting. I'm going to mark that right now. Something happened there. I stand with her in her walls with not a shred of terror, malice, nor a word of jeer. Darkly I gaze into the days ahead and see her might and granite wonders there. Some slant rhyme going on there, jeer and there. They rhyme close enough for me. Beneath the touch of time on Erin's hand, G, like priceless treasures sinking in the sand. G. Okay, so this is an English sonnet. I'm going to go through what that means really quickly here. It's pretty simple. The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So what that means is every other line rhymes. There are three quatrains. And then a heroic couplet at the end. A heroic couplet means it's two lines of rhymed iambic pentameter. The entire thing is written in iambic pentameter, which is the convention for uh, sonnets. Although she feeds me bread of bitterness. There we go. Although she feeds me bread of bitterness. That's a horrible way to read it, right? But that's that's the rhythm. So you would read it more naturally than that. But you've got your one, two, three, four, five feet, thus pentameter. So it's called pentameter. And it's an I am because it's dot dot. It's got an accent on the second syllable of that foot so there's five of them pentameter and it's an i am so it's iambic pentameter 14 lines of that makes this a sonnet the, the the specific rhyme structure that we're using makes this an english sonnet and it's uh it's also got a a, 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 a it's a Shakespearean sonnet, if we want to be even more specific than that. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Shakespearean sonnet is that it, one of the other parts of the sonnet, the volta, can occur in two different places. Uh, right around here, usually, is one place, or right at the heroic couplet is the other place. Uh, so he's got the strong signal word. This is our... Uh, eighth line, interestingly enough. I, I think the ninth is normally where the turn happens. It's kind of funny. He puts the turn just like one line earlier than I might have expected it to be. Um, so that, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's modernist, but it is interesting that he can be so tight in terms of how, um, how much he adheres to the structure. But then a couple times he will choose to break things. So the turn happens just a little out of place here. Um, what does it mean? So although she feeds me bread of bitterness, so, uh, well, she, first off, we've got some imagery there, feeding bread of bitterness. That's that's uh, being fed a kind of bitter bread, something that makes you, you're, he, he's surviving on this. He's being fed it, but it's bitterness, so it's making him angry and upset. And and then she sinks into my throat her tiger's tooth. So we have more of that alliteration here. Bread of bitterness, tiger's tooth. Um, it's not a nice relationship he has with this person, right? Stealing my breath of life. Uh, the breath of life, I think, is that's what uh, in Christian uh, mythology, that's you know how they. It might even be all world religions. It might be how they refer to uh, God breathing life into the clay and, and when he formed Adam from clay. I believe that's called the breath of life. Um, there are other ways the phrase is used, but that's what it comes to mind for me right away. Uh, I will confess. So stealing my... So yeah, it, it, in the breath of life, he's being choked. The tiger's tooth is you know actually on his throat. So that would steal his breath. Right? He confesses, I love this cultured hell that tests my youth. So even though this is a really horrible place to be and makes, you know, it's trying to kill him, he loves it. Well, that's crazy. Why? Uh, because her vigor, her vigor flows like tides into my blood. So because of the vigor, um, it gives me strength against her hate, strength erect against her hate. So all of this, 
all of this, he, it's just giving him fuel. Her bigness sweeps my bean, bigness and beans. I'm a little more, more alliteration there, like a flood. And that flood, we've got back with tides. So we get that image being tied together there of, of well, water and flowing, um, which is a big, well, flow. There we go. Uh, this is a big part of what it is for him. And now he's got the turn, which, as I said, comes a line earlier than I would have expected it to. Yet, as a rebel fronts a king in state, so as you might um, confront someone, as you might rebel against someone else as a rebel confronts a king, I stand within her walls, so within the walls of the the country as as an american uh, with not a shred of terror i'm not uh, i'm not scared or, or malice or, or trying to hurtful and i'm not trying to make fun of it i'm not trying to tear it down darkly this is a word this this is a word that is used to um as a signifier in african-american literature particularly of that time uh, darkly i gaze into the days ahead uh, there, we've got that rhyme of days and gaze as well as the alliteration of darkly and days and see her might and granite wonders there that was rhyming with our near rhyme with jeer <clears throat> so he looks ahead and he sees lots of good things to come he, he stands I, i'm not worried maybe he's, he's not he's not worried about the revolution he knows there's or he, well, he is because he's a rebel, uh, but he's not worried about the past because he sees what's going ahead. Um, he sees her might and granite wonders there beneath the touch of time's unerring hand, like priceless treasures sinking in the sand. Um, so in a way, well, maybe I've got it backwards. There's a little bit of ambiguity here, which is another one of those modernist um well, lots poet, lots of poems love ambiguity, but I believe it's a little ambiguous here because, yeah, he does see a an empire, an American empire forming, but the way he describes it, that um, that the might and granite wonders there are beneath the touch of time's unerring hand, like priceless treasures sinking in the sand. I mean, this guy loves the English Romantics. This is definitely a callback to Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley which warns not to be too proud of your grand empires because all things fall in time. Um, okay, so uh, that's a rather ambiguous look at America, right? Yeah, this pla I love this place that hates me, and it's going to be great, and it'll be gone one day. It's, it kind of resists an easy interpretation. All right, <clears throat> let's take a look at another one of his poems. This is the Harlem Dancer. So let's take a look at the rhyme scheme. Applauding youths laughed with young prostitutes, A, and watched her perfect half-clothed body sway, B. Her voice was like the sound of blended flutes, blown by black players upon a picnic day. She sang and danced on gracefully and calm, the light gauze hanging loose about her form. To me, she seemed a proudly swaying palm, grown lovelier for passing through a storm. Upon her swarthy neck, black shiny curls, luxuriant fell and tossing coins in praise. The wine flushed bold-eyed boys and even the girls, kind of running out of room there, devoured her shape with eager, passionate gaze. But looking, but, I'm going to mark that right now. That is clearly the turn. But looking at her falsely smiling face, I don't think that's a near rhyme with gaze, I think, or praise. I think that is its own rhyme. I'm going to call that G. I knew herself was not in that strange place. Okay, so A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. We have seen this many many times before this is the traditional shakespearean sonnet english sonnet shakespearean in that the turn can occur in a number of places um in this case unlike the previous poem that we looked at uh, in this poem the harlem dancer the turn occurs right at the end with the uh, heroic couplet again we have three quatrains 
and a heroic couplet to give us a, a total of 14 lines uh, with the rhyme scheme as I previously described. And it's all in iambic pentameter. So it's got all the hallmarks of a traditional sonnet. That's right. Applauding youths laughed with young prostitutes. <coughs> Pardon me. So yeah, that's not quite iambic, but you can still see it's the five. Right, we've got I am, I am, trokey. I'm gonna go with a mono meat, a mono meat. Laughed with young prost. I mean, there's a number of ways you could accent this. I suppose if I really want to keep the 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 rhythm a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more harmonious, I could drop this to a trokey or or, uh, or something like that. But it still feels natural the way it comes out. And the point is, it's clearly setting up those five feet, you know, and watched her perfect half clothed body sway. It's I am's. That's much more, much more naturally comes out as I am's. So we're going to have I am big pentameter the whole way through. Okay, let's take a look at what it means. And this is one of those ones that upsets other thinkers of the Harlem Renaissance because it is uh, just so upfront about um well prostitution and uh some of the seedier sides of life in harlem applauding youths laughed with young prostitutes well there we go right away and watched her perfect half clothed body sway so they seem to, it's called the harlem dancer they're watching a woman dancing um it, they're with her young prostitutes so it's probably a nightclub dancer which could range in um meaning as far as uh, uh exactly what kind of dancing and how risque their dancing would be but it's implied that it's pretty risque given the company her voice was like the sound of blended flutes um okay so that's a interesting simile there her voice was like the sound of blended flutes so i guess we're hearing her while she's singing blown by black players upon a picnic day that's an interesting line because it's got this alliteration not just bb but blbl BL, like bbb blown by black players and even the pl almost sounds like a bl and the p can uh match with that p so we've got a lot of alliteration there in fact blown by black players upon a picnic day breaks that really tight 10 syllable structure that he's got throughout the entire one iambic pentameter blown by black players upon a picnic day and that's interesting to me because he's got 11 syllables there and he he so easily could have just said blown by black players on a picnic day blown by black players on a picnic day and he would have had that neat 10 syllables perfect uh, syllable count um, and I think that this is intentional because he creates by changing on to upon he is creating more alliteration with players upon and picnic he's got that P sound repeating again and it also being so close to the the B sound here it really adds to the the poetic quality of of the uh, of the poem of that of that line uh, she sang and danced and gracefully and calm the light gauze hanging loose about her form so uh, the imagery of just the what she's wearing um and it's light gauze so again a little bit evocative in that we imagine we can see through it um to me she seemed a proudly swaying palm what interesting uh, to me it i just felt like that was interesting because of the, some of the words before i really expected the word to be swan or something else uh but palm yeah so a palm uh, and i guess that that makes too sense too that's the kind of image you might think of i suppose if you're from the west indies uh, i'm not so i don't naturally imagine palm trees when i imagine wind i imagine uh, you know oak trees and the types of things that i see outside of my window um, you would not see a palm tree in Harlem, certainly. Um, but that's what he sees, uh, a proudly swaying palm. And not just a palm, a palm that's grown lovelier through passing through a storm. Interesting. So it's like a palm it, that's survived a hurricane. She is damaged, but she's still beautiful. That's what he's saying. Upon her swarthy neck, black shiny curls, luxuriant fell. Look at that enjambment. It just runs on to the next line and then starts here. So that's pretty interesting, even though he plays with this very tight structure, but still has 
room to make it natural by using those devices like Enchantment. And tossing coins in praise, the wine-flushed, bold-eyed boys, bold-eyed boys, and even the girls. I like the way that comes, that, that rhythm of that still has that ten syllables, the wine-flushed, bold-eyed boys, and even the girls. Oh, it's an eleven one. There you go. Well, that definitely makes sense, because what I was going to say is that it feels like it's rushed a bit, and even the girls. Uh, adding that extra syllable, I think, it, again, I feel like this is done intentionally there are other ways he could have done this devoured her shape with eager passionate gaze everybody loves what she looks like you know everybody thinks she is beautiful but but yes she's beautiful but he sees but looking at her falsely falsely face false and face are the two words that alliterate so that connects them again it's not just that it's it's falsely smiling face it's a false face um, it's, it's like Dunbar's mask, right? But looking at her falsely filing, falsely smiling face, I knew herself was not in that strange place, self and strange. I knew herself was not in that strange place. So he sees that she's not really there. She's somewhere else. She's got some other life happening. And this is what makes this poem kind of beautiful and um uh, wonderful i think and what a lot of people celebrate is that moment that interior life that interior moment that we get for the harlem dancer it's what makes it less exploitative um it's not just you know showing us something erotic it's actually showing us you know the the sentiment and the the pain and everything behind uh, that body Okay, so those are two poems with some very quick analyses. Uh, and, and I know that there's a lot more I could say. There is so much more I could say. But I don't want this video to go on too long. So I'm going to stop there.